I'm YH Hong, the MBA program director. This is our second webinar in this year. We are organizing different webinars in the coming months. In each webinar, we will invite experienced speakers to share their valuable knowledge and experience in different business with us. And this evening, we are very happy to have Mr. Andrew Shelton from Europe. Hi, Andrew. Hi, thank good you very much for joining us uh, in Hong Kong. You are in the afternoon, right? So good afternoon to you. And let me introduce Andrew. Andrew is the Managing Director of Aviation Advocates. This is an independent strategic and government affairs and publishing company based in Switzerland. Their clients include the major industrial suppliers, airlines, ANSP, that is air navigation service provider, regulators, service providers, and airports. Andrew has wide ranging experience in the legal, commercial, and our political aspects of the aviation industry. He has been involved in some of the most major developments in the industry. He also regularly writes about and comments on aviation. Previously, Andrew was a chief legal officer of Cotes Airways before being resp resp responsible for government affairs for IATA and then SITA. He is the executive director of the ATM Police Institute. Andrew is also a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society. Andrew's topic in this evening is aviation, my five most disheartening lessons. After Andrew's talk, we have a Q&A session. If you have any questions for Andrew, please put them down in the chat room. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Mr. Andrew Charlton, please, Andrew. Thanks very much, YH, and good afternoon or good evening. It is, of course, in Hong Kong to all of you. It's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. When, um, <clears throat> when I was approached and asked to speak to a group of MBA students and MBA alumni, uh, a number of thoughts came through my head. The first one is that I have never studied an MBA. I don't have an MBA. I have a very poor, a very poor law degree, but um, in, in degree terms, but um, I have managed somehow or other to survive and to eke out a career in aviation, notwithstanding that. The second thing that I realised I wanted to talk about was that notwithstanding the most usual way people approach these sorts of subjects and talk about all the important things that they've learned or all the important things that I've understood, Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately for me, or maybe it just says everything about me, the things I've learned in aviation really are what you should not do. What don't you do? Why shouldn't you do this? And it's absolutely true in, in aviation that all of the things that you learn at business school, we don't do any of them. And actually, the things that you learn that whatever you do, don't do this, that's what we do we're really good at doing the things that you shouldn't do. Aviation is a particularly strange business. Now, I suspect that everybody you speak to in every business will tell you that it's a particularly strange business and we do particularly strange things. Um, but I'm prepared to put aviation at the forefront uh, of any industry as to how strange we are and how, how back to front we do things. Part of the reason for that is that even today, or perhaps more today, and I'll talk about COVID and the pandemic and what have you a little later, but aviation has started, or start, modern aviation starts in 1944. Um, I wasn't born then. I don't even think YH was born then. Um, 1944, the war was still going on. World War II was still going on. And at the Yalta Conference, at the Yalta Conference, Roosevelt and Churchill realised that aviation had become a really important part of modern warfare and they could see it was going to become an important part of the modern world, the modern world in 1944, I hasten to add. And so they agreed that, that the world should get together and we needed a regulatory framework for international aviation. Now, 
it's it, it's true that there was already an international framework for aviation. The international framework for aviation goes back even further to the First World War. And one of the clauses, one only clause in the Treaty of Versailles, which I'm sure you know is the treaty uh, for the end of World War I, acknowledged that every country has the complete and absolute sovereignty of its airspace all the way up to the heaven. Now, <clears throat> now in fact, in the mid-70s, we changed that. We bring in the, the Treaty for the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which says that outer space is actually common and common is the commons and should be treated as own, belonging to everyone. But nevertheless, in, in the Versailles Convention, we agree that the states own, each, each state owns its own airspace. The reason why that was put into the Versailles Convention is because in World War I, for the first ever time, aeroplanes are a part of how we conduct the war. The Red Baron, the, the Royal Air Force and what have you. Also balloons, of course. Balloons would drift over the enemy lines and drop bombs and those sorts of things. A lot more dangerous in a balloon, though, of course, because you could be shot. But um, well, you could be shot in an aeroplane as well, truth be told. But in any event, we had, we had a system in place that assumed sovereignty, national sovereignty. And then we get to World War II and we realise that it's really important that we have some sort of system for regulating aviation. But there are a lot of important things to note about that. One is, of course, 1944. We're talking 1944. So we're now talking 77, 76 years ago. It's a long time ago. <clears throat> There's no disputing that. The second thing is the world was completely different in 1944. Because for a start, when they have a convention to regulate aviation, the convention is convened in Chicago in November and December of 1944, so it must have been very cold. Uh, and only, of course, only the Allies, only the winning team could attend. And consequently, it's very much victor's justice. But the other and really perhaps most important part of the history and why this is so important is because if you think about 1944, the war is ongoing, people most of Europe has been bombed. Almost every factory in Europe has been levelled by either German or Allied bombing. My parents, who grew up in Australia, my parents were donating saucepans. My grandparents were donating saucepans to the British so they could melt them down to turn them into aeroplanes. That's how desperate they were. So in Europe, there are no factories. There's practically no aviation left because the, it's been the battlefield. Whereas over in the United States, they had huge factories, they had all sorts of resources, and they had companies like Boeing, Lockheed, Douglas, McDonnell, Hughes, all building very big, very strong bombing aircraft, bombers. <clears throat> it takes practically nothing to convert a bomber into a passenger aeroplane. All you need to do is put windows in the sides and put some seats in, and pretty much you're there. Oh, okay, a kitchen, yeah, you know, some of those safety signs, maybe a, a system for in-flight movies, but, but nothing, frankly, terribly important. So when the Americans showed up to Chicago for the Chicago Convention, they were proposing an open, completely free, anybody could fly anywhere at any time system. And the British, who were also there, obviously, the British and all of the Commonwealth countries realised that if they did that, America would win forever. Uh, and the, the American aviation industry, which was much better and much more ready than, than any other, would, of course, be the winner of that. So the, the Commonwealth team, the British Empire team, let's be honest, the Commonwealth team decided that the solution was to put in place a system that, that banked on the Treaty of Versailles every country has its own airspace rule and requires every country to be in charge of its own aviation, to license its own pilots, to give airworthiness certificates to aircraft and so forth. But more importantly than that, required an airline that flew from one country to another country to be uh, only to fly those, those routes if it had been agreed by that country and if that airline was, and here I'm quoting, substantially owned and effectively controlled by nationals of that country. In other words, the right to fly between 
Hong Kong and Australia or, or, or Australia and the United Kingdom is not a decision taken by BA or Qantas or Cathay. It's a decision taken by the government of Australia, the government of Hong Kong, the government of the United Kingdom. And only once they've agreed how many flights and how many passengers can transfer, then they designate airlines to fly those routes. And the, the designated carrier must be substantially owned and effectively controlled by the nationals of the country making the designation. It has been a terrible, terrible burden on aviation since about 1945, frankly. It made perfect sense in 1944. It makes no sense in the year 2021. It is completely ridiculous. And we are stuck with a system that comes from a different generation, <clears throat> excuse me, not only from a different generation to us, and I suspect I'm older than you, uh, but a, a different system, frankly, to my parents. Maybe my grandparents would have understood it. But aviation continues under a system that requires enormous state intervention. The second thing that comes out of that, of course, is that states are more able to control what's going on than has, has been the case in almost any other industry you can think of. If you think of some of the other critical industries in, in a country, banking, television, broadcasting, they have managed to, yes, there are national requirements, yes, there are national restrictions, but as a general comment, they've allowed for transborder ownership. That's not always true, and it's certainly not the case in, in some countries close to Hong Kong, but it's certainly true in many Western countries that, that um, transborder ownership is normal and that <clears throat> we're in a place where the issue, even, even in mainland China, of course, the issue is not who owns the bank, but who is in charge of licensing that bank. And do they behave in accordance with the licensing rules? In aviation, we've never got to that point. We continue to require, and, and America it has to be, let me tell you, the worst of all countries for this is the United States, be under no misapprehension, or as, or as I like to call the United States, the United Soviet States of America, USSA, um, they are incredibly restrictive as to who can own airlines, who can manage airlines, and, and what, who can fly into and out of the country. When they can, America tries to allow as many American flights as possible out of America, but of course they immediately restrict flights into America very, very rigorously. So don't always believe the gump, don't always believe the propaganda that you see off both sides in this conversation. But where we end up because of that national framework, where we end up is with frankly smaller national airlines that fly around. So my first contention, and something that I think will strike you as strange, is there is no such thing as an international airline. There is no such thing as an international airline. All there are are airlines, national airlines, that sometimes fly to other countries. But there are no cross-national shareholdings. There are no cross-industry uh, arrangements. All there can be are national airlines that sometimes try to form alliances with other national airlines to pretend, pretend that they are providing you with an international service. So, and for example, if you are flying Cathay to Paris, you then can't buy a Cathay ticket to fly, sorry, you can fly Hong Kong, Paris, I don't think you can fly Paris, London just because Cathay doesn't operate that service. But what you certainly cannot do is walk into a travel agency in Paris and ask to buy a Cathay ticket from Paris to London. You just can't do that. States only fly to and from their national, their national hubs or their national homes. That led in aviation prior to about 1975 or 1990 in Europe when deregulation started to happen. That led to the creation of massive national airlines with normally one huge hub. Hong Kong in the case of Cathay, obviously, London in the case Heathrow in the case of BA, Charles de Gaulle in the case of Air France, except Sydney in the case of Qantas, etc. And what that meant was, and, and their economic model was what's called the hub and spoke model. Cathay is a slightly interesting um, variation on that, as a matter of fact, but the general hub and spoke model was you flew in a small aeroplane into the big hub 
and then you got onto a big aeroplane and you flew long haul on that big aeroplane. So if you lived, if you were unfortunate enough to live in Adelaide, you could get out of Adelaide, which at least would be lucky, by flying from Adelaide to Sydney and then Sydney to London on a big aeroplane and then from London to Geneva or Paris or wherever you needed to go. That, is, that economic model works on three things. The first is it works on having a lot of spokes. The more spokes you have going out from your central hub, the more passengers, there may only be 10 people in Adelaide that want to go to London today. But if there's also 10 people in Brisbane and 10 in Perth and 10 in Sydney and 20 in Melbourne, if you put all of those people together, you've got one aeroplane full of passengers going the other way. And the same is, of course, true in reverse. So the economics depends very strongly on spokes out of a hub. The second thing that it does is, of course, it requires the hub to increasingly become a fortress. You have to have complete and utter control to the extent that you can over that hub and how it works and where your terminal is and what your terminal looks like and how you make the transfers and all those sorts of things. And that's a real problem in the aviation system that we have. And the third thing it does is it leaves you really badly exposed to competition, both in terms of new players coming into that hub, which is why airlines fight so hard, so desperately to stop any new competition coming into an airport they serve. And of course, it also means that you are very badly exposed to new business models. And so let me, if I may, ladies and gentlemen, take your attention now to Europe for a minute. Think about Europe, because in 1991, Europe deregulates. Europe creates a pan-European common aviation market. The pan-European common aviation market effectively puts a fence around the outside of the European Union, which obviously recently got shrunk in by the shape of the United Kingdom, but that's not important. Well, it is to them, terrible, stupid decision, but it is to them. But Europe is a single market. And so anybody can start in any country in Europe, can start an airline in any country in Europe and can operate from any European point to any other European point. So Ryanair, by way of example, you've probably heard of them. Ryanair is an Irish airline and it can operate from, from Paris to Berlin with no restrictions. The French can't stop them, the Germans can't stop them, nobody can stop them. That So the business model, however, the business model for Air France is to have an enormous hub in Paris and lots of spokes. And, to have an, and the business model of Lufthansa is to have an enormous hub in Frankfurt and lots of spokes. So that means if you think about a route like Oslo to Pula or Oslo to Dubrovnik, that's a good example. Dubrovnik, a beautiful city, Roman architecture. If you've seen Game of Thrones, you've seen Dubrovnik. It's uh, Westeros. Uh, the... Beaches, beautiful wine, beautiful olive oil, lovely things like that. If you are flying on Air France or on Lufthansa, you've probably got to go Oslo, London, uh, Oslo, Paris or Oslo, Frankfurt, and then on to Dubrovnik, which leaves open point-to-point -point carriers like Ryanair and EasyJet that can fly Oslo, Dubrovnik nonstop. That has two implications, of course. The first is that you don't have to do a transfer through an airport and all of a sudden that's become really important for COVID reasons. Nobody wants to spend more time in a crowded building if they can avoid it, of course, wearing their mask or very uncomfortable. And secondly, it means that <clears throat> a non-stop service is always preferable because it'll be quicker and they can price it cheaper. But the way Ryanair and EasyJet do this is they set up bases of only three aircraft, four aircraft. And and if they don't get a good price, they move their base to some other place. They're constantly moving their base to some other, if they can, because, because that allows them to continually negotiate on their price and to continually drive down the price, which leaves the big traditional legacy carriers in a very difficult place. So this is probably as good a point as any for me to introduce to you my slide for what it's worth. They said, you know, please have slides, all those things. I said, I've only got one, um, which I think shocked them a little bit. But there you go. Here are my slides. These are the things that no one teaches you at, at your MBA school. But these are the single most important things about aviation. And frankly, they're very disheartening. So the first thing that you have to know about aviation and, and my long explanation of the Chicago Convention and deregulation brings us to this point is that we have got self-induced commoditization. 
we have got to a place where the only thing that matters is price. And even if you are very, very good and you've got a wonderful product and the softest chairs and the longest leg room and flight attendants with the whitest teeth and the best meals, no one cares. It's all about price and price really matters. And price even nearly overtakes safety. I'm, I'm not making this up. Let me tell you, let me tell you two little stories. Many years ago, uh, when, when you work for Qantas, you're very proud of your safety record. Of course, never had a crash, blah, blah, blah. All those things, great safety record for an airline. But Qantas, compared to Garuda, the Indonesian airline, and I mean absolutely no disrespect to Garuda, for Qantas, a flight from Sydney to London could only afford to be $100 cheaper, uh, sorry, more expensive, could only afford to put a gap of $100 over Garuda before passengers flew Garuda. There was the safety premium that Qantas had built up at that stage by 75, over 75 years of incredible attention to detail was good for $100. Against Cathay, against Singapore, against uh, other airlines, it was worth BA, it was worth nothing. We could not price above them. And when Qantas Airways, and here's my second story, when Qantas Airways uh, incorporated Australian Airlines as part of its privatisation process back in the 90s, when Qantas incorporated them, we, we finally made the decision we would stop branding Australian Airlines as Australian and Qantas Airways as Qantas. We made everything Qantas Airways. We painted the aeroplanes red. We put that big kangaroo on the tail, all that stuff. And we launched a product. We, we, we launched a celebrations fair. And the fair was Sydney to Melbourne, $100. Aussie, I think it was one, might have been returned. Sydney to Melbourne, $100. And if you'd bought the newspaper that day, you'd have seen the front page of the news. You turn over, there on page three was this ad, welcome to the new Qantas, Sydney, Melbourne, $100 introductory offer. And we had 3,000 tickets sold in one day. This is before the internet, of course. People had to ring you up and talk to you. Okay, and we, we sold 1,000 seats in a day, 3,000 seats in a day. We thought this was fantastic. At the time, we had a competitor called Ansett. <coughs> Ansett, the next morning, you open the newspaper, you turn it over to page three, and there it is. Sydney to Melbourne, love to, you know, welcome Qantas, $99 on Ansett, $99. Of the 3,000 people who had made a booking, we had 1,000 people ring up and cancel. Now, you have to understand that at the time, it cost 21 cents to make a phone call. So these people had rung us and made a booking, they then see this the next day, they ring Ansett and make a booking, and then they ring us and cancel their original booking. So they've spent 42 cents to save $1. Price matters. Price matters. And we have self-induced this, of course, by running to constantly bigger aeroplanes, which have more seats. And the only way we can sell them is by selling, stack them high, sell them cheap. We sell at very low rates. We use incredibly sophisticated software systems called yield management to make sure that what we do is that we price to ensure that we cover our cash flow. We, we sell half our seats at the marginal cost instead of at the fully costed cost. And we understand nothing about, or let me re-say that, when we sell a ticket on an airline, it has nothing to do with the price of providing the service. We sell on what we can get out of the market. It costs whatever it costs to operate an airline. And an aircraft costs about 25,000 euros an hour to operate. So they're not cheap by the time you put people in them and staff and you maintain them and all those things. But we have developed a pricing system that encourages low cost, that encourages competition against our competitors based entirely on price, and we have and, and encourages a drive to the bottom. And part of the reason why we do that is because, because to come back to my original point, the Chicago Convention, because the system prohibits us from offering services other than to and from our state of incorporation, it's impossible for any airline on earth to operate a service to every point on earth. 
but there will always be passengers that need to go to every point on earth. So we have to organize a system between ourselves as airlines as to how we cooperate and how we, how we swap passengers over. And once you do that, you've organized the process whereby a passenger can make transfers on their own accord and, we, and is able to do all sorts of things to stop that from happening or to, to stop you from pricing him up and pricing him through. He can start to buy his own tickets and all those sorts of things. So it becomes incredibly difficult for us to, to enforce higher fares, even when you have higher quality. And again, let me say that once upon a time, if you'd bought a ticket on an aeroplane, you could buy one ticket in first class, you could buy one ticket in business class, which is a point where the better you are, the more expensive, the more you can charge. But you could always buy 10 tickets in economy class, depending on how early you booked, how many days you stayed away, whether you have a dog called Sally, whether you're left-handed. We've got a bunch of conditions that we make up as we go along, frankly, uh, and, and we let and we price it. Nowadays, there are three classes in first class. There are three fare rates in first class and four or five in, econ in business class. So even in the high yielding classes, first and business, we have increasingly put in systems that allow passengers to pay less. We are a machine. We are a machine for self commoditization And once you do that, your quality doesn't matter. And that's the first really important lesson that, we, that, that you won't learn at business school for all the right reasons, which unfortunately we apply every day in aviation, every single day of the week. <clears throat> the second one connects to that. The second most complicated thing in aviation, of course, is that not only are we completely ruled by government policy, and the Chicago Convention 1944 continues to be the dominant all important document for Europe, for global aviation. All aviation works with it. Not only is that the case, but we then use it as a weapon. We use it to do a number of things. And the first thing, of course, we do is we try very, very hard to stop competition using it. Uh, we don't let anybody come in if we can stop it, if we can help it. We we have hidden behind <clears throat> what in Australia we like to call the infant industry argument. The infant industry argument, you might have heard of it, is when you say, look, we're a brand new industry, we're just arriving, uh, we need some support, we need some protection until we get on our feet. The Australian motor car industry used that argument for many years, but aviation is the world's oldest infant industry. The, it has never grown up. It's the Peter Pan um, of international uh, industry, really, because it just refuses to grow up. Um, and, we, and we constantly use the infant industry argument and the, and the nationalism argument to, to prevent any competition. And if you think that's wrong, let me refer you to a dispute that Qantas had with Cathay in 1994, 93, when at the time of Qantas's privatisation, I'm very aware of it because I was in charge of it, and at the time, under the agreement between Australia and the United Kingdom, we could fly to the United Kingdom over Hong Kong, Bangkok or Singapore. They were the only three routes we were allowed to use, but, oh, and, and I do beg your pardon, and uh, Los Angeles and Johannesburg. Um, and, and we were flying to, uh, we were flying, of course, Sydney, Hong Kong. We weren't flying Hong Kong, London, but we were flying Sydney, Hong Kong. And... And the number of passengers that we were flying was capped by the Hong Kong government at the time. And, and then we, and some of those passengers would fly to Hong Kong, have a five-day holiday or a 20-day meeting break, and then fly on to London. And, and Hong Kong argued that any passenger, no matter how long a gap between flying from Sydney to Hong Kong and then flying from Hong Kong to London, was actually a Sydney to London passenger and consequently had to be included in the count of how many passengers we were allowed to fly and allowed to carry. In other words, they were trying to use an incredibly arcane argument to prohibit Qantas offering continue, uh, further services up to Hong Kong. They, of course, were quite happy to sell London uh, over Sydney or out of Sydney over Hong Kong and, and, and have as many flights as they could, but they were quite happy to hide behind the Air Services Agreement to try to, to stop us from doing that. I'd have been very cross about it, except I'd have done exactly the same thing if I was in Hong Kong shoes, if I was in Cathay shoes. But my point only is this, that 
you can use international treaties, you can use whatever it takes to force differences with your competitors in a way that is just really bizarre for an industry that's as old as aviation. And whilst modern aviation started in 1944, arguably, just a reminder that actually aviation is um, 100 and, uh, when was it, 1903, I believe, was the Wright brothers. Um, and so aviation is 117 years old. And the first ever commercial aviation flight was in um, 1914, a flight from somewhere in Florida across a bay so you didn't have to drive all the way around. Uh, it was an aircraft that had two seats, one of which was the pilot. So you either had a load factor of 100% or 0%, <clears throat> but it was uh, the first ever commercial service. So commercial aviation has a, a 100 year history, um, but still we like to hide behind our infant industry status. The other thing about government policy as a weapon, of course, is that we put nationalism first and foremost. We, we will argue whenever we think something's going wrong, we say, well, obviously we need to protect our own country, we need to stop any sort of competition. Uh, and we're watching this enormously in Europe when the European Union, which has taken a view that having a lot of air transport is good for the European Union, has gone and signed air, very, very, very liberal agreements with air, air service agreements with other countries. And, and one of the countries with whom they've signed that is Qatar. And you probably know Qatar Airways is a very aggressive airline. It's wholly state-owned. Uh, it doesn't seem to need to make a profit to continue to operate. But then, frankly, no airline does anymore, let's be honest, uh, COVID, et cetera. And, and consequently, the, the Germans and the French in particular have lobbied like crazy to try to stop the European Union from actually finalising the agreement with Qatar because they think that will introduce still more competition. As COVID goes on, we're going to see more and more countries retreat behind their national airline. We're also going to see, of course, those national airlines get renationalised. Alitalia in Italy has huge amounts of money. Lufthansa has 9 billion euros of German money in it. Air France has got 4 billion euros. KLM has 1 billion. The, the numbers are mind-blowing, absolutely mind-boggling, as states are coming back to owning their own airlines. And and we've always done this. We've always done this. We've always put the flag on the tail, haven't we? You know, the hints in the name, British Airways, Air France, American Airlines. I mean, Quant Air New Zealand. Qantas is an exception because it doesn't actually have the word Australia in it. But the, the kangaroo is a bit of a hint. Okay, so we, we tend to misshape the way in which uh, we misshape into the form of nationalism an industry which should be for the good of the world. And it should be for the good of the world because we, we offer connectivity, we offer international exchange and, and intercourse, which is obviously good, and, of course, we facilitate trade. And historically, the argument that we've always used for trade, incidentally, ladies and gentlemen, is that we say no aviation, no trade. You know, we are, is, as, as GDP goes up, aviation goes up. As aviation goes up, GDP will go up. The really fascinating thing about the COVID crisis has been that that has decoupled. Zoom, he said on a Zoom link, Zoom is changing that. And there was an, a report recently, and if you're interested, I'm happy to send you the link, but there was a report recently in the Financial Times which has shown that mobility has fallen by 25% in the COVID crisis but GDP has only fallen by five. We seem, Zoom or whatever, seems to have de-linked GDP growth and mandatory mobility. Uh, and that's a really scary, troubling prospect for aviation because our argument normally is, but if you, if you limit aviation, well, the world's going to end. And so that's not the case. So that brings me now to number three, and this apropos of nothing to do with that, another of the great mistakes, by which I mean enormous, I don't mean fabulous, another of the great mistakes that we make in aviation is that we put our worst paid people closest to the passenger. We pay our chief executives and other executives an unbelievable amount of money. We pay air traffic controllers an unbelievable amount of money. We pay pilots twice as much unbelievable amounts of money. But the flight attendants, the check-in agents, 
no, we don't pay them anything at all, really. We, in fact, ask them to pay us. Um, we, it's As a business strategy, it leaves you hopelessly exposed to your very demotivated staff. And if you've ever had the misfortune of flying on an American airline, you will know what demotivated staff look like. The, 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 the policy that we have in terms of management of our staff is really backwards. And I can't believe there's an MBA school in the world that teaches that. As I said earlier, I wouldn't know. I've never done an MBA. But um, I do think that this is one of the great mistakes that we make as an industry. The, the fourth mistake is that we only seem to have one strategy. And I hope you've got your pens out. I hope you've got your pencils out because if you want a job in aviation, you need to know the three-pronged strategy. We use it for everything, absolutely everything. COVID, sustainability, wage increases, what you name it, we use it. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the three-pronged strategy. Deny, reject, complain. They are the three prongs of what we do as management whenever anything happens. First of all, we deny it's a problem. Oh, sustainability, carbon emissions, we're only 2% of the world's emissions. What, you're going to go without aviation? We then, here's a solution. Why don't we tax fuel? Oh, no, that's not going to work. And then when someone introduces a tax on fuel, oh, what are you doing? You're ruining it for all of us. Deny, reject, complain. Our three-pronged strategy that we use in all circumstances, and I've, I've picked on sustainability, but I could have picked on everything else. Let's think about vaccination passports. Let's think about lockdowns. Let's think about any of those sorts of things as well. Um, and then finally, the, 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 and this is the single most important mistake I believe we make of them all, frankly, and that is because of the history of aviation, because of the fact that when we, when we regulated aviation, when we thought about aviation as a system for the first ever time, the airlines, the airports and the ANSPs, except in the United States, were state-owned, almost exclusively state-owned. And we thought of all of them as a single thing. And the airlines continue to, to, to pump the point, to bang the drum, that says that aviation is a value chain. You've got your airframe manufacturers, you've got your airport operators, you've got your caterers, you've got your air traffic control agencies. Their only job, their only job is to be a life support system for airlines. And the airlines don't care if any of those people make a profit. In fact, they'd prefer that they didn't make a profit so that the airlines could make a profit. And that is the value chain thinking. You don't get anything other than a profitable airline. If you have a profitable airline, the system is working perfectly. I reject that. I reject that absolutely. In my view, frankly, that is completely wrong. The only way forward is to think of aviation as an ecosystem. The little bird that plucks the flea off the back of the rhinoceros is as important to that ecosystem as the rhinoceros. And, the, and you can't have a healthy aviation industry unless you've got healthy airports, healthy air traffic control agencies, healthy caterers, healthy grand handlers, and, of course, healthy airlines. You've got to have profitable airlines. You've got to have profitable airlines because otherwise you're going to be compromising safety. You're going to be making life difficult for everybody. But the entire system is currently structured in a way that makes that almost impossible to deliver because we can't allow airlines to consolidate. We can't allow airlines to start having international services that go across different borders. We can't allow for the way in which the airlines are managed to be different. We don't recognise our staff as valuable. Um, and and we're, we're still in the denial phase, I think, of the sustainability argument. So I have five minutes left. So let me just finish by having a quick word to you about COVID um, because COVID, I mean, what else is there at the moment? Obviously, the aviation industry has been very badly affected, very badly affected by, um, by the, 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 the bans on travel, the lockdowns and what have you. Of course it has. And none have suffered more, I think, than, than Cathay, of course. But where do we go from here? I think what we're starting to see already 
what we're starting to see already now is that the airlines are downsizing. They're downsizing in two ways. The first way is they are retiring any big aeroplanes. They are retiring A380s. You'll never see a 747 passenger aircraft flying again. You'll never see an A340 aeroplane again, which is a good thing because they're a terrible aeroplane. Uh, even the 777 is frankly too big. And certainly the 777-200 is frankly too big anymore to fly. What you're seeing is the arrival very quickly of uh, the 787 and the A320LR and the A350. Now, Qantas was looking at going non-stop Sydney, London with an A350-1000, an amazing um, thing. Does avoid you having to go through an airport, though, which is a good thing. Um, and, and, and the A321LR, single aisle aeroplane, but able to fly very long distance. So we, we are starting to see smaller aircraft with smaller seats in airlines that have smaller fleets of aircraft. In other words, there will be fewer seats on the market. And I think ultimately, after we get through the big sugar rush of, um, of discount seats to get everybody back in the air and what have you, we are going to see smaller airlines. If we didn't have the international system that we had, I think we'd also see significantly more consolidation of airlines, which I think would be a good thing. Because this uh, is a point worth making. On the, 31st of Jan on the 31st of December in 2019, Okay, so before COVID, at the end of what was 10 brilliant years for airlines in terms of growth and profitability, on the 31st of December 2019, there were 30, 30, 30 profitable airlines in the world. We've too many airlines. They have to fly segmented, fragmented sectors. It's crazy. We need an international aviation industry that allows you to price value as qu and quality that is free from government policy and, and is able to operate as an international industry that respects its staff, that, that listens to the arguments, doesn't just fall back on denying, rejecting and complaining, and that acknowledges that we need a very healthy aviation industry, that the industry exists in, in itself as an ecosystem, we don't just need profitable airlines. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I will hand the floor back and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Andrew. Let's see, do we have any questions from our audience? Well, so if you would like to have I'm not, I'm not that scary. I'm always happy to answer questions. Don't feel obliged to type either. You can just, you know, turn your mic on and talk. Yeah, so if anyone you want to ask any questions, please uh, raise your questions in the chat room. And Ooh, Andrew, turn your mic. Andrew, I have a question for you. Certainly, please. So you just give me a surprise because I force I know uh, aviation industry quite well because I flew almost every week uh, or twice a week. The fundamental, the fundamental mistake, YH, the yeah. fundamental mistake. Yeah. Yeah. But now I know there's lots I don't know. <laughs> well, but I have another question. In China, in the past 10 years, they try very hard to develop the high-speed railway, the high-speed train network. So how do you see this type of transportation, the high-speed railways, compete with Aviation. Uh, I, I think there are a few things to say to that. I think it's fantastic. I, I really, I really uh, endorse the fact that there's competition. Uh, the, obviously, there are environmental issues around high speed rail. Um, because, and, and in Europe now, Air France has received a bunch of aid from the French government on condition that whenever there's a competitive high speed rail link, they, they won't operate those services. Um, and the having said that, the, it's more complicated than that, of course. I think if there's competition between high-speed rail and the, and the airlines on domestic or, you know, regional services, then that's great because the more competition, the better. Secondly, there's every chance that it is environmentally more sustainable, but it's not guaranteed. Because, of course, trains are very noisy and they're very noisy for the entire length of the journey. 
aircraft are very noisy, but they're only very noisy in two little tiny spots and all the rest is, is out of there. And the emissions necessary to fuel the trains, it's as important to know what is fueling, what are the power, what's the power source fueling the train and how many emissions did you emit making the rails and the sleepers and all those things. I think by the time you add all that up, it, it becomes somewhat more problematic. But the other thing about trains, of course, is that they're quick they're comfortable and they get you to the centre of the city. So it's important not just to look at the sector lengths, but also that if you're getting from the centre of the city to the centre of the city instead of the airport, then there's every chance the train is better. What that means is that the airlines, and, and to be fair, the airlines are doing this, the, fair, the airlines have to be really studying intermodality. They need to be able to work out how to make transfers from a train to the to the aeroplane and so forth. And Hong Kong leads the field in that. Hong Kong leads the way, of course. You can check in at the train station in, in um, on Victoria uh, in downtown and then go all the way out to the airport and you don't need to lug your bag and all those things. So all of those things, I think where we're going to go with that is we're going to see a lot more intermodality. People will fly to Frankfurt, catch the train to Hamburg. No, not Hamburg's a long way away. Uh, catch the train to Cologne or to, to Basel or places like that, rather than having to make a transfer. Uh, I think it's a really good thing. I really welcome it. Good. So I, I thought the, the, uh, how the airlines compete with the high speed uh, railway is fine with the short distance uh, transportation. For so sure. I believe airlines, they have a more uh, strong uh, power to run the air, uh, the the uh, airlines, they are uh, in a long haul distance. Yeah, yeah for sure. they, they will compete with the uh, railway. Well, However, I think there are two things there. Two things to say there, YH. The the first one is that obviously, if you're from Australia you, and you work for Qantas, you don't feel all that competitively threatened by the railway system to get you to London. Um, for the so let's call that though very long haul. But the train isn't a very good competitor if all you want, if you want to go, um, I'm, I wish my Chinese geography was better than it is. Um, if, if you wanted to go from Oslo to Croatia, the train isn't a competitor yeah. because you're going to need to make a number of changes. It's going to take quite a long time, whereas the aeroplane can go straight through in an hour and a half, two hours, something like that. Good. Thank you. So now we have another question. In the COVID world, do you think airlines with a small domestic market, say example, Hong Kong or Singapore, can survive without government support? I think it'll be extremely difficult. Very difficult. Why? Why is it difficult? Because I think in, I think the domestic... Well, because I think that Hong Kong, by way of example, Singapore is another, are what we call sixth freedom carriers. And I think... A number of things are happening for sixth freedom carriers. Hong Kong, Cathay is slightly different because of the China thing. But if we think about Singapore, it has no domestic market. It is going to be competing with airlines that fly nonstop from their country to Singapore. And increasingly, they are at risk of being overflown by longer haul aircraft. If, if, Cath if, if Qantas starts its nonstop London Sydney service, and it already operates Perth, London nonstop, then I think that's extremely difficult for Cathay to compete with. They are going to have to compete on price. They are going to have to reduce their fares even further. And I think it is fair to say in Singapore that they have significant amounts of market of government support, including an incredibly non-competitive, incredibly um, heavily subsidised airport, which is a, a massive value asset for them but which they don't pay for and which the state does pay for. And, and not having a domestic market makes it, I think, is go in, in a world where, unfortunately, nationalism is going to come back even more post-COVID, I think that it will be increasingly difficult for um, airlines with small national, uh, small national populations to survive. Cathay has the benefit of being very close to China and the, the big population that obviously that China is. Um, but for Singapore, that's a lot harder. I, I think it's going to be difficult. I think Qatar, Etihad um, in Dubai, and uh, sorry, Etihad in Abu Dhabi and Emirates in Dubai are going to be more difficult. It's going to be harder for them without state support 
than, for example, Turkish Airlines, which has got a, a domestic population of 70 million. How about Indonesia? I find that Indonesia, they have built a lot of airports in last five or six years. Yeah. So how, how do you see this country? in well, a, a, a it's, um, it's, it's, um, it, it's interesting. It, the, the, the rule seems to be that as the as the, how do I describe this? As what defines being in the middle class moves by one percentage point. In other words, as 1% of the population moves up the development scale to becoming middle class, then aviation increases by about 10%. In Indonesia, a 1% of the population moving up is 125 million passengers or potential is 125 million people. If only 1% of those people now start flying regularly, you're talking 125,000 passengers. That's a lot of passengers. And if 10% do it, it's a mill. So it's, it's, it's a huge, the, the, Indonesia is a country of huge numbers, um, which is really confusing, but it's also a country still coming up the development scale. And sometimes I think the, what, despite being upset as a general comment about the Chicago Convention, what I think Indonesia perhaps shows is that regulation matters, right. is that aviation depends on safety and aviation depends on well-regulated safety because otherwise it becomes very difficult. And so consequently, I think it's, um, I, I think he would, I think it's, um, it's going to need to develop better regulatory control of what it's doing. Mm -hmm. And and then I think Indonesia is another India. Yeah, I think Indonesia they have a very unique environment. Mm -hmm. People they live in thousands of islands. Also yeah. true. Also yeah, true. so they're very hard for them to travel uh, yeah. uh, between the islands. Yeah, so the air air is a very good transportation tools for them. Oh, absolutely, in many ways. I mean, despite being exactly opposite. I think Indonesia is very like Australia. You know, aviation is a really important part of how you get around in Australia. It's an important part of how you get around in Indonesia as well. They've got water, we've got desert. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it seems it's very quiet in our chat room. Oh dear, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> sorry about it. Okay, so Andrew, do you have any additional points you want to share with us? Uh, well, the only the only other point I should have perhaps raised is that about 10 years ago now, IATA, the International Air Transport Association, asked Dr. Michael Porter to do a very detailed study of the aviation industry. And his basic conclusion was everything about aviation is wrong. Yeah. Nothing about aviation is right. And I do genuinely believe the reason why he thinks that or he thought that was because aviation tends to think like a value chain. And I really, really, really think we've got to think like an ecosystem. So with that... Um, YH, I will, I will wish you well. I, I hope the rest of your seminar goes well. And thank you very much. And thank you to all the students for their attention. Yeah, we thank you very much for Andrew. You share a lot of the industry secrets to us. And <laughs> I do believe I and my students and our, our alumni, we learned a lot from you. Well, and I really hope I, so. I absolutely yeah. hope so. And if anyone has any questions, drop me a line. Right, very good. Yeah. And I do believe those contents you just share with us is very hard to learn from any other MBA schools except <laughs> for you. you know? Well, possibly, quite possibly. <laughs> because you come to Poly U this evening and you talk with our students. So our, our MBA students, they have a chance to learn the five secrets from uh, in the aviation industry from you. So it's very My good pleasure. evening. Yeah, I learned a lot and I do believe we also appreciate uh, your talk very much. So thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye now. And